Hello, oh. hello everyone. Uh, I'm Tiffany Farrell, president of Southern Maryland Audubon Society. Thank you all so much for coming to our presentation this evening. It's a free program titled Restoring Common Turns and Black Skimmers in Maryland. Common terns and black skimmers are listed as state endangered in Maryland due to rapidly declining populations in our coastal bays. The bare and sandy islands they require for nesting are eroding due to climate driven sea level rise and colonies are threatened by human disturbance and predation by gulls, crows and others. One way of recovering populations of beach nesting seabirds is to provide artificial nesting platforms in appropriate locations. Our speaker will introduce a new project that does just this. Um, and our speaker tonight is none other than David Curson, who has worked as Director of Bird Conservation for Audubon Maryland DC, which is the state office of the National Audubon Society since 2004. In 2018, he also became interim executive director. His duties include designing and implementing ornithological conservation programs and research, directing the science department, policy outreach, coordinating advocacy, fundraising, and administration. That's a lot. <laughs> Dave grew up in London, England, and in 1985, he, returned, he received his B. SC in ecology at the University of East Anglia. He came to the United States in 1993 to begin graduate studies and received his MS and PhD degrees in the Department of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His graduate research focused on the ecology and behavior of brown-headed cowbirds and their hosts in Northern New Mexico. Welcome, Dr. Kirsten. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tiffany, um, and you know, welcome everyone. Um, it's uh, really good to be back um, with uh, Southern Maryland Audubon Society. Um, I've really enjoyed meeting with you in uh, past years, and so uh, here we are on screen. Um, and today I'm excited to take you away from the mayhem that we've been seeing in DC today um, to uh, something that a little bit more peaceful. Um, but also quite important, and um, to talk about uh, endangered seabirds uh, over on our Atlantic coast in Worcester County. Um, so you'll see on the screen here a couple of things. Um, I, I have David Kirsten, Audubon, Maryland, DC, but in parentheses, Audubon, Mid-Atlantic. And I think many of you have heard that we are, our state office is merging with Audubon, Pennsylvania shortly. Uh, we're in the process of hiring a new executive director. And when that director starts, which should be um, in the next month or so, uh, we will become Audubon Mid-Atlantic, a regional office with uh, more capacity. And uh, I'm really excited about expanding um, the, the team uh, that I am part of. So um, if anyone has any questions on that, at the end of the talk, I'd be happy to address those. Um, you'll also see that uh, there are three logos at the bottom of the screen. So for this project, Audubon is partnering with Maryland Department of Natural Resources and the Maryland Coastal Bays Program, both of which are very heavily invested in this. And the Maryland Department of Resources, um, they approached uh, me at Audubon and um, they've given us, awarded us a contract uh, to work with them and the Coastal Bays program on, on implementing this project. So it's very much a, a three-way partnership. Okay, well, let me uh, um, launch into things here. Let's see. Okay. Here we go. So a big conservation issue in our uh, coastal bays of Worcester County on our Atlantic coast is that three of our most iconic um, sea colonial seabirds are endangered. Um, they've been declining for quite a few years. And what you see here on the right, these graphs show this decline. We can quickly just run through those. Black skimmers back in the 1985 um, 
there were over 250 pairs nesting in the state. They've declined, uh, particularly in recent years, since 2000. And now they are very near to extirpation as a breeding species in Maryland. Uh, in fact, no young skimmers were raised last year or the year before. Um, common terns, similarly, have declined a lot, a 90% decline uh, since the mid-1980s. They're in a little bit better shape than black skimmers uh, because there are large uh, nesting colonies on Poplar Island in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but uh, there's still, it's still a very alarming decline. Uh, royal terns that you can see a picture of royal terns at the bottom of the screen. Um, they're in a similar state um, as the black skimmer because they nest only in the coastal bays in Maryland, just like the black skimmer. And they need uh, large colonies to kind of stimulate them to, to breed. And those colonies have collapsed in recent years. Um, and that's a uh, reason why they're endangered. So they are, are almost at zero as well in terms of their, uh, the number of chicks they're producing each year. Um, each year, the Department of Natural Resources and Coastal Bays program actually um, recruits volunteers from the public to monitor these birds. And that's one reason why we have good data on them. Okay. Now let's look at the reasons for these declines. There's three reasons. The first reason is that many of the islands in the coastal bays are eroding and disappearing entirely. Uh, there's been a number of these uh, that have gone. This, this photo uh, set shows Robin's Marsh and you can see um, the disappearance of this island. In the middle photo, you can see David Brinker of the Department of Natural Resources waving his arms and, uh, and then in, um, uh, in a later photo, whoops, let's just go back here. Um, in a later photo uh, in 2014, uh, you can see that the island's totally gone. Now, the, this erosion is due largely to sea level rise. Um, and a lot of the erosion occurs during um, uh, winter storms, uh, where the wind comes from the northeast uh, and uh, washes uh, these islands. Way. Another big problem is human disturbance at islands. And um, you know, 300,000 people go to visit um, Ocean City each year. Uh, and I think that's at any one time there can be 300,000 people there. So the, the total throughout the summer is significantly more. And many of those people go out on boats and they, they come from other areas. Uh, and so they don't really appreciate um, that these islands have birds nesting on them. And this photo shows um, a place called Turn Island, uh, which was actually a rebuilt island. Uh, the US Army Corps rebuilt an island in 2015 uh, with sand, and it was specifically for seabirds to nest on. But as soon as it was built, um, people started setting up you know, uh, tables and umbrellas and such like on there and the birds never really stood a chance. But it's really notable that even though the DNR did post the island shortly after this and keep people off, the island had eroded again and disappeared within two years. So these are problems that kind of uh, uh, are in, they're all happening together at the same time. Now, one thing that Audubon has been doing in recent years is trying to have a kind of a different set of messages for boaters to encourage them to uh, leave the islands alone. Um, you know, the, the Department of Natural Resources posts the islands with regulations and a lot of people uh, aren't really, uh, I guess they don't like regulations, they're not very impressed with those and that doesn't keep them off. So we thought we would uh, create children's artwork requesting people to keep off these nesting islands and we've posted these at um, boat ramps uh, throughout Ocean City. So that's just one thing uh, that we've done, uh, which has some impact. People notice these, these islands, uh, these uh, signs. So hopefully um, that kind of 
they think of those signs when they see the regulation signs as well. So another reason for the decline of, of these skimmers and terns is predation. And um, you may know that gulls and crows are very common predators of eggs and chicks of terns and skimmers, uh, colonial water birds that are nesting in very exposed situations. And the only defense these birds have is to kind of fly up in unison and attack the crows and gulls. Um, and the, the royal terns and the um, common terns are really aggressive against those birds. The black skimmers are much less so, and they actually try to defend themselves by just embedding their colony within a tern colony. So they kind of, uh, they hope that the terns do the defense work for them. But there's a, another predator that is really um, insidious in a way is the great horned owl. Uh, when these islands are close enough to wooded areas on the mainland, great horned owls can detect them by the noises that they make or if they see them in the daytime. And they come over at night and they will take the adult birds. So when adult terns are sitting on the nest, great horned owl will, will just uh, take the, the sitting birds. And you can see this little um, uh, camera uh, that was on Skimmer Island a few years ago captured this image of a great horned owl uh, taking a great, uh, common tern. Uh, mammalian predators are also a problem, uh, less so where the islands are fairly remote, uh, but where they're very close to shore or on uh, Assateague Island, um, foxes and raccoons can be uh, a real problem for these colonial birds. Now the whole coastal bay's um, ecosystem is actually one of Audubon's important bird areas. We identified this one, oh, I guess it was about back in 2009, 2010, and we held an IBA dedication ceremony. You can see a bunch of people there in that bottom photo holding um, important bird area signs. Uh, we haven't had one of these ceremonies for a long time, but it's a great way to kind of impress upon local officials uh, the importance of the area for birds and also to give agency folks a kind of a, a, a pat on the back and encouragement and acknowledgement uh, for the really important conservation work they do. So the coastal bays is an important bird area for quite a few different um, bird assemblages. I'll just run through these. So the island nesting seabirds that we were just talking about 100% of Maryland's royal terns and black skimmers nest in the coastal bays, as I mentioned. Uh, another group, colonial wading birds, which is our egret, cybuses, and herons, um, has a really large colony um, in the coastal bays, 2,300 pairs. It's one of the largest colonies of colonial wading birds in Maryland, seven species there. And, um, you know, that colony is at risk at the moment. Uh, the area is also important for waterfowl. They get up to 30,000 ducks and geese in the winter, including uh, about 1,100 grant geese, which is 100% of the Maryland population, and 7,000 or so black ducks each winter. It's a great place to go and see uh, all different kinds of ducks uh, in the winter. And you can see them from um, all, uh, a lot of different uh, places. So it's a good place for watching them. And then uh, let's not forget the salt marshes around the edge of the coastal bays, which are um, important for the whole, the whole assemblage of salt marsh birds, including um, the salt marsh sparrow, which is rapidly declining um, and at risk of extinction. And uh, the coastal bays is globally important for that species. Now, a couple of years ago, we worked with DNR and the Coastal Bays program to produce a report on the colonial water birds in the coastal bays and the islands that uh, they need. And we wanted to kind of document um, the current state of affairs with these birds and the islands. And, but we also wanted to um, create a, a kind of a format that we could uh, give to decision makers, elected officials, uh, where um, it would be very accessible to them. 
And so we devised this map with these, uh, this kind of color code of severity of some of the threats, including things like erosion and disturbance. You can see here that's listed as trespassing. And also to give an idea of you know, the relative abundance of terns and skimmers and wading birds. And we can uh, superimpose on this the, situ the current situation, well, not really current, but the 2017 situation where we have detailed data. Uh, for each of our three uh, birds of concern um, for common terns, um, these are, um, they require barrier islands and salt marsh. They'll nest in quite small colonies. They don't need such big colonies as some of the, uh, as the other two species. And they will nest in a lot of different artificial situations. But you can see here that their colonies tend to be concentrated at the northern end of the coastal bays in the, in the vicinity of Ocean City and Skimmer Island. Uh, let's see if I can move my cursor here. You can see Skimmer Island here, right by Ocean City, has been an important colony uh, for many of these birds. Uh, Skimmer Island is now almost completely uh, disappeared. So in 2017, 151 pairs of common terns nested there, and now it's, it's zero. If we move on to look at the royal tern, uh, this bird is a little bit more specialized than the common tern. It's bigger and, and louder and more aggressive. They really like to nest on quite inaccessible islands. They're very, um, they get really freaked out by the possibility of, of predators and they need an island big enough for their young to uh, form a crash after they've hatched and the young all get together and they walk around in a big gang. Um, so they like to be near an oceanic inlet. Well, that's not a problem, o Ocean City, because there is an inlet there. They really like a good um, all around view. And for defense, they like to nest in really large, very dense colonies. And they do best if there's more than 100 or 200 pairs. Um, they haven't been known to nest on artificial uh, floating platforms before. Um, so uh, that would be a more ambitious project to try to cater for royal terns. That would be a first if we could get them nesting on artificial islands. But you can see in the map that in 2017, uh, there were only three colonies um, that had uh, royal terns. And they, so, a really a bird of concern and now that's down to zero as I was explaining. Now with black skimmers, uh, even in 2017 they were very much on the brink. You can see just 10 pairs in the whole coastal bays and that means only 10 pairs in all of Maryland. Um, they like to nest within turn colonies as I mentioned because they they're really not very aggressive. In fact they're kind of uh, although they're very impressive in terms of their foraging ecology, you've probably seen them uh, in life or at least on perhaps on television, they have this amazingly unique feeding strategy where that beak, you see that lower mandible is longer than the top mandible. They fly along and they dip that lower mandible into the water and create a little disturbance, a linear disturbance, maybe about 10 yards long. <clears throat> then they turn around and they fly back along exactly the same route where they made that disturbance. And again, they dip their beak in the water, they trail it in the water. And what they're doing is they are feeling for fish that have been attracted to that disturbance because fish are attracted to small disturbances, uh, thinking that it might be uh, insects on the water surface. And when they detect, they feel a fish, they'll snap it up in that beak. So it's a very impressive feeding strategy. But when it comes to nesting colonies, they're a little bit kind of dopey and uh, they really don't defend themselves well. So their strategy is to tuck themselves in as a group to the edge of a tern colony and let the terns do the, the protection work for them. So they tend to come along after the colony the is established and then they um, set up shop within it. 
Now there is one, uh, one or two examples of black skimmers nesting on artificial structures. Uh, one in the Salton Sea quite a few years ago, and just this last year on a big barge in Virginia. So we're hoping that we can cater for this species right off the bat. Okay, now this slide is just to make the point that um, in uh, a fairly recent uh, conservation plan um, by the US Army Corps of Engineers, they did, um, they did identify the importance of uh, creating and maintaining islands for these beach nesting colonial water birds. So this issue is on the radar screens of uh, federal and state agencies, but at the same time, those same agencies do need encouragement from groups like Audubon um, to kind of follow through and um, provide these nesting islands for these birds. So we've identified a kind of a long-term strategy for what we think these birds need. Uh, we know that we need to focus on the coastal bays because um, they're uh, because the, the black skimmers and royal terns uh, tend not to nest in the Chesapeake Bay as much as they do in the coastal bays. And we think that there are two really important strategy components. We need to work with the US Army Corps to make sure that over the long term, the Corps uses sand that is dredged from the Ocean City Inlet and other marinas and harbors around the Ocean City vicinity uh, to maintain um, islands that are eroding uh, for birds. So ideally, you know, we want natural islands for these birds, that those are gonna work best for them. But we're recognizing the dire situation and that in the short term as a stopgap measure, we uh, think that using artificial nesting platforms is gonna be really important to get these birds uh, re-established as nesting species in the state. And we spent a little time last year looking at different options for artificial nesting platforms. We looked at barges, which are very big and very expensive and rather unsightly in some situations. So we kind of discounted that option. We also thought about pontoon boats and pontoon boats are interesting uh, because they're cheaper and smaller, but they're still more expensive um, than a raft. Um, and I need to move up. Here we go. Um, docks, uh, floating docks are quite commonly used and easily bought, but again, they're, they're more expensive um, than constructed rafts. So we looked in more detail at constructed rafts. And we found that a wooden framed raft, uh, which is about 16 feet by 16 feet can be built with materials that cost around $5,000 or not much more. And so that's the option that we decided made most sense. Now, when we went for, um, we applied for a permit for putting these rafts out because you need a permit for any structure that's kind of anchored to the bottom that might shade submerged aquatic vegetation. And we put together a kind of like a, a few cases of um, artificial structures to show that these birds will use them. And there's a really interesting case right now down at the southern end of the Chesapeake Bay. You may have heard of the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, which had a lot of work done on it over the last year. Um, the, that work displaced thousands of um, seabirds that, for, that were nesting uh, on it. And so to provide an alternative nesting site for some of them, um, the Virginia um, Department of Wildlife uh, Resources um, placed nine barges at the mouth of the James River in 2020. They covered them with sand and pea gravel and they used decoys, a wooden, well, I guess they're plastic decoys of skimmers and common terns to attract the birds. And they actually got a pretty good response. You can see it in this little table that uh, 329 nests of common tern and 70 nests of black skimmer 
was set up this year in the very first year of this uh, kind of experiment. And a lot of young were produced. Um, and nearby uh, royal terns and laughing gulls and sandwich terns, they did not use these um, barges, but they nested on, on other structures. There's another case that we included that because it, up in Toronto, uh, they have a design for a wooden raft, which is very much what we would like to use. Um, and uh, back in the uh, 1980s or so, the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority put four wooden rafts um, into small embayments in Lake Erie, uh, right in Toronto. And um, they were successful. Um, they've uh, had a, a kind of a, a checkered history because being so close to the mainland, they did have mink swim across and get uh, onto these. So they had to, uh, and that reduced the number of common terns nesting on these rafts uh, down to zero. And um, so they uh, had to redesign these rafts to have a, a like a metal predator baffle all the way around. And once they'd done that, they managed to kind of rebuild uh, that term colony. But this 16 foot by 16 foot wooden raft uh, with, with pea gravel or other nesting substrate uh, on top is a successful one that we have decided to uh, copy. Here's a kind of a close up of the latest design that they're using in Toronto. Um, and a third case study was in um, Ohio, in, uh, in the, uh, Lake Ontario there. And um, these are actually pontoon boats. And uh, each of these pontoon boats has a small number of um, common terns nesting on it. And they've worked quite successfully too. So this shows that you know, common terns are quite versatile in, uh, in these different structures that they'll use and they'll, they'll take very readily um, to different artificial nesting situations. Okay, so for this project, what we decided to do is, as I kind of alluded to already, is that royal terns are just too difficult to cater for, um, at least as a kind of a start off a project. So we've decided to uh, try to get common terns and black skimmers uh, nesting. We feel that common terns will be pretty easy to, um, to attract and set up shop. And if we can get a large enough number of them that we should be able to attract some black skimmers to come and set up a colony on the edge of the, um, the common tern colony. So we've, uh, we've decided to go with this um, wooden framed raft, uh, which is 16 foot by 16 foot. But that, that one of that size would probably only support around 70 or so common turns. We'd like to get a larger colony than that. So we are gonna put four of these wooden rafts in a cluster. And we're actually, we decided, we've been talking about the design over the last couple of months. And we've now decided to bring these rafts so close and to actually lock them together. So effectively, even, uh, we will have a 32 foot by 32 foot kind of artificial island um, out there. And we're hoping that that should provide plenty of room to have both turns and skimmers. We're gonna put it out um, in Chincoteague Bay near South Point. Uh, South Point Spoils Island is where there's a very large um, heron colony that I told you about earlier. And kind of, we'd like to put it near uh, that place. I'll talk about how we selected the site a little bit later. We're gonna use social attraction with decoy birds and sound systems. And I'll show you that later on as well. Some of the um, other design features, these islands will have edge walls to prevent the chicks from falling off the edge, but we're not gonna have the, um, the metal flange, that, that barrier, uh, that predator barrier for mammals. We feel that the site we've chosen 
should be free of foxes and raccoons and mink. They should, probably won't get out there. And um, it's gonna be a lot easier to build these, um, these rafts and lock them together, kind of treat them as modules that can be added together if we don't have that structure. So we're gonna try it without that first. Um, we're gonna provide uh, chick shelters and you can see these little triangular little houses there. They, those are pretty important for giving the chicks some shade from the sun and also um, some protection from predators. So if a great black bat gull does come along, uh, the chick can, chicks can kind of shuffle under there and get a little bit of protection. These rafts will be anchored at each corner and we'll use pretty heavy concrete anchors on chains. Um, and this last point, 10 foot distance between the rafts, uh, I guess that's uh, out of date now. We've been you know, uh, updating the design. So these, raft, these four rafts will now be kind of locked together. We, did, we selected the site for where to put these birds um, with a GIS analysis. And we wanted to find a site that um, met a number of criteria. Firstly, we needed to avoid places with uh, weed growing underneath, submerged aquatic vegetation. And the big reason for this is that these structures need permits to place them. And uh, we would not get a permit if we wanted to put it over a place where it would shell, uh, shade submerged aquatic vegetation. So that when you go to get a permit from Maryland Department of Environment and the US Army Corps of Engineers, they bring in all the other agencies and the fisheries folks uh, really don't like it if you shade uh, SAV. We also wanted to find a place that was fairly sheltered. Um, the coastal bays is very open and exposed, um, but we, we knew that if we could find a place where the water is quite shallow over a large distance, kind of a shallow shelf, the, the larger waves and the, the, the more forceful wave energy gets broken when the waves from the open bay um, hit that shelf. So we did find an area where the water depth was kind of two to four feet. And we feel that that should be relatively sheltered. It's sheltered by some, a couple of small islands too. Uh, we wanted a place with sandy substrate, not silt. And one reason for that is that in order to place these rafts, uh, a number of uh, people will have to actually get into the water and walk around. And in deep silt, uh, that's kind of rather dangerous and difficult to do, but the sand is really easy to walk on. We wanted a place close to the wildlife management area, which is actually um, made up of a bunch of the different islands in the coastal bays. Um, and that is so that the DNR can be the kind of a legal manager and guardian of these structures. We wanna be away from predators, especially gulls and great horned owls. We wanted to find places a long way from Ocean City so we didn't get too much kind of curiosity traffic uh, in terms of boats, uh, you know, visitors in boats. It'd be nice if people didn't really know where they were um, and weren't attracted to them. So we also needed to be uh, near, fairly near a public boat ramp and, uh, and to avoid national park service areas, which would, would have made permitting a little bit more complicated. So we went through this analysis and uh, when we thought we'd found a good looking place, we, we went out there with some, uh, <clears throat> some volunteers who uh, volunteered to take us out. And um, we were able to walk around. Uh, you can see in this uh, picture myself and David, Dave Wilson, uh, who used to work in the Coastal Bays program and now works uh, a lot for Audubon as a consultant. You can see how shallow the water is there. It's, it's kind of two feet. Um, so we will, um, it'll be in, in about two feet of water. So th this is kind of a location map. You can see uh, the map of the coastal bays here. And um, <clears throat> the high traffic disturbance areas are in this red area around Ocean City. 
but by the time you get down to Chincoteague Bay, it, there's a lot less boat traffic. And uh, moving over to this location map here, we mapped out the SAV and other areas, and we found uh, this kind of this area here should be ideal. It's relatively sheltered by South Point Spoils Island just here. And there's another island over here on the east side um, and very shallow water um, all around. So this should be an ideal location uh, for this, for these rafts. Um, a few other interesting details about the project. We actually, we've hired two builders to build these rafts and we found two people who are really interested in the mission and they have a lot of really ingenious ideas so we've actually uh, the design of these rafts has really been an interesting process and we feel that they have um, they're kind of experts in knowing what materials to use and what kind of design will stand up to um, the weather that we'll see out in the coastal bays we intend to um, put these rafts out in the, uh, uh, the site next April. And one thing I should mention is um, we're gonna use clamshell as a nesting substrate on the, the rafts instead of the pea gravel. And one reason for this is that it's cheaper uh, than pea gravel. Another reason that it, is that it's more lightweight. And we're very concerned that um, yeah, we, we, do, we want these rafts to ride fairly high in the water. We don't want too much weight pushing them down into the water because we don't want um, the waves of storms to kind of crash over them and um, perhaps you know, make the eggs uh, cold. We've had good advice from National Audubon Seabird uh, Research Institute. So that's my colleagues at National Audubon. Um, and we'll be using volunteers to build some of those little chick shelters that we'll put out on the rafts. And the social attraction, I think on the next slide, I can show you here a close up of a common turn decoy. And Audubon, now National Audubon, has its very own little company called Mad River Decoys that produce hundreds of these turn and skimmer decoys for different projects each year. So we're going to put about 100 of these out and hope that we can create a super stimulus um, for the turns and skimmers to uh, pull them in uh, pretty quick. And in order to um, have even more of a kind of a social attraction function, we're gonna place two sound systems, which will be solar powered uh, at each opposite corner of the overall cluster of rafts, and they'll play the call of common turns. And hopefully, um, that will help to, to bring these turns in um, almost as soon as they arrive back from the wintering grounds in the Caribbean. Uh, generally, they, you know, they move around enough that they should find this, this place, these rafts, uh, really very quickly. And we should um, hopefully see them setting up shop um, by you know, even uh, very early May, we think. So um, with that, I'll, I'll uh, put it out for any questions. I'll be happy to answer those in, in person. So remember to unmute yourself if you have a question. Hi, I have a question. Um, after the rafts are installed and after you see the birds using them, how do you count and determine success without disturbing the colonies too much? That's a really good, uh, really good question. Um, you can uh, kind of watch them from afar um, you can also use drone imagery. You can yeah. fly a drone over and take a photo. Um, and you know, we should be able to count nests that way. Um, you know, one option is later in the season is to actually go and land on the structure. Once they have young, they tend to be very faithful to those. So even with one disturbance event, they won't abandon young. They, they will abandon eggs. Um, so in some colonies, you know, Dave Brinker and his volunteers will go in and band young. Uh, we're not going to do that on these, but we may, we may have a single visit um, to more closely assess uh, the nest at some point. But our current idea is to do most of the monitoring using a drone. Okay. And do they overwinter in this area? 
Well, the common terns don't. They go a long way south. They go down to South America um, and I think the Caribbean. Um, the terns that you sometimes see in winter in the coastal bays are the Forster's terns. You, you get a few of those um, spending the winter. Thank you. Yeah. I see a question uh, also, David, from Julie Daniel in the chat box. She okay. asks, um, why couldn't you use one raft instead of joining four rafts together? Mm, that's a great- I guess, I guess by that she means one big raft. Yeah, that's right. I mean, why not build a big 32 foot by 32 foot and put it out there? And the, the answer is logistics. Um, we the best way to get these things in the water i mean they're really heavy um is to what well, we've we've come to this uh design where we're actually going to have a float the floats that make it float um some of them are going to be wheel floats so they have wheels on them um and this means the best way of getting it into the water is on a boat ramp and we're going to construct these rafts on a volunteer's property very close to a boat ramp and the boat ramp is only 13 feet wide this means that even the 16 foot by 16 foot is too big and so our solution is we're going to build half rafts of eight we're going to build units that are eight by 16 feet we're going to roll those down into the water and then connect those together uh, very tightly to form 16 foot by 16 foot units. And then we're gonna tow those 16 foot by 16 foot units out to the site. And then we're gonna put everything together on site. Um, this has really been interesting. We've had quite a lot of meetings and we've, we've uh, had a lot of discussions about the logistics of how this is gonna work. Um, and we, we can't find any examples of where people have done this kind of a project in this kind of a situation. So we're having to um, kind of create it from scratch in this, uh, to a certain extent and really adapt the Toronto raft design to fit uh, the situation that we have. David, will they go out of the South Point boat ramp? They will, Mike, yeah. And we're gonna have, um, you know, we'll have volunteers at that stage because what we want to do is we will need to shovel the clamshell onto them at the boat ramp, then get them in the water. And then kind of once they're connected together, we'll need people to kind of rake out the clamshell into a kind of a two inch layer across it. So it's going to be uh, you know, an interesting undertaking. So. They'll look for volunteer opportunities <laughs> in, <laughs> in April. So we probably won't need a lot of people, but we'll need a, a small number of very robust people. <laughs> so, so David, will you also once they're out on the water? Yeah, that's right. Even when they're out on the water, we'll need uh, we'll need people to get in the water and help to secure these things and uh, lash them together and such like. So it'll be fun. Of course, the water's going to be really cold in early April, so uh, it'll be, you know, doubly fun, I guess. So. so, David, will you also put the little shelters out right away? That's right, yeah. The chicks. Yeah, we will place those early on um, so that we don't have to kind of go back again and disturb the whole setup. You know, when the birds are investigating the islands and setting up and laying eggs and incubating the eggs, at that stage, they're very vulnerable to disturbance. And if they do sense, you know, predators, they can desert the, the place. And we really don't want that to happen. So we'd like to set it up as complete um, and then just kind of leave it to its own devices and just watch it with, with drones um, and, until we get to that chick stage. I see there's also a question. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Will you be able to observe where they're floating from South Point? No, we won't because they'll be the other side of South Point Spores Island. And that was really by design. Uh, we wanted them to be in a very remote spot where very few boats go. And um, 
you know, after looking at the whole of the coastal bays, we found this, this little area is really very suitable because it's quite inaccessible and remote. There's one other question in the chat um, for you, David. It, it's from Gwen and Larry Peters. They ask, are the clamshells whole or pulverized? Uh, they're crushed. Uh, they're, they're different shapes. So uh, we actually went, uh, one of our project partners went to a clamshell uh, supplier recently and took some photos. And we were kind of discussing, oh, these edges look a little bit sharp. Is that going to be a problem? And, and, we, and we don't think it will be. Um, so. I'm David, just can you put me on the list to volunteer come spring? Sure, yeah. Dave Wilson is um, his uh, kind of Audubon's liaison on the ground. So let Dave know and uh, he'll, uh, he'll enlist you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be great to have you, uh, your help, uh, Mike. So do you, have a, do you have a dry suit? <laughs> Unfortunately not. Yeah, we'll have to borrow some. Hopefully the Coastal Bays program will have some and we can, because I think getting in the water where you might be at sometimes up to your waist in April is going to be a, a, an interesting experience. <laughs> Even if you work outside all year wrong, that's going to be a little chilly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow, that's just so fascinating. All the research you've done. I, I'm surprised you were able to find a spot even that met all of that criteria. That's yeah, just amazing. I was really, you know, that, that whole process was good because, um, and I was really surprised at how it narrowed down to just a small area that met all those criteria. And the, the, there's definitely, definitely the prospect that if there is a major predation event, let's say that a great horned owl does somehow find these, this site, that will totally undermine the whole project. And what we would have to do then is to find a different location. And um, we've kind of identified a couple of backup locations further south in Chincoteague Bay, which meet most of those criteria. The tricky part about those is that they're that much further from a public boat ramp, um, which doesn't kill the project, but it just means that it's logistically more challenging because you have to tow them a lot further um, and such like. But um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I hadn't really, I didn't really know the coastal bays that well before we did this analysis. And uh, I learned a lot about the different characteristics of different parts of the system. Sorry, do you have any guess about whether this could actually take off like in the first year even or no? Well, we think it should, yeah. The, the fact that the common terns are really versatile and, and adaptable and the fact that they, I mean, they've evolved to take advantage of resources that move around. So if you think about the, the coastal bays before that system got stabilized by by building the inlet at Ocean City, the whole, the, the natural barrier island system, the whole geomorphology of them is based on um, storms um, penetrating and, and uh, the islands, the island barrier washing over it and opening up inlets that then close again due to sand deposition. So naturally it's a really dynamic system. And what that means is that islands uh, that they get deposited and then eroded constantly as these kind of break, uh, these uh, breaches uh, change position with storms and such like. And so these birds have evolved to kind of constantly find new nest sites. And what that means, I mean, that's very much in our favor because it means that they will find this uh, pretty quickly. Any more questions? Any questions about anything else? Well, these are such beautiful and interesting birds and I'm glad you're focused so um, seriously on them. 
Yeah, well, you know, my my goal, thank you. Um, my goal is to have us, I'd love to have a project manager, an Audubon project manager down in the coastal bays. And I'm hoping that this merger, this, this kind of new regional office structure uh, with National Audubon is kind of investing in us. They're gonna give us a new executive director and we're getting a new policy person as well. So I'm hoping that that will give us the capacity to fundraise and have a project manager who can be, basically be a coastal steward for these birds year by year. And they would actually have multiple um, elements to their job. They would be looking after these floating nesting rafts. They would also be liaison with, with the Army Corps to try to make sure that when sand becomes available from dredging operations, it can quickly be kind of uh, garnered and put on Skimmer Island, which is kind of the, the best natural island site for m uh, many of these birds, so that we can maintain Skimmer Island as a viable nesting site. And then there's other things too. There's helping the National Park Service on Assateague Island, National Seashore, to look after the terns they have. They have colonies of least terns, um, and sometimes one or two skimmers on Assateague Island and from year to year they have to scramble to put together a kind of a crew of beach stewards and if Audubon could have a project manager who could be fundraising and um, basically recruiting a band of volunteers and having them really well trained then that could help the, um, the National Park Service to have a kind of a more stable situation of like, you know, a number of stewards that could really be relied upon. Um, so I see a lot of different uh, ways that, you know, well, needs really, staffing needs for, for the stewarding these, these populations down there. You know, National Audubon has coastal stewardship programs in quite a few states, all up and down the East Coast. And so we have model projects that we can follow and that's what we want to kind of emulate uh, those um, programs in North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Connecticut, New York. They all have them. And, and since I've been working here, we haven't. And it's really bugged me. <laughs> so I think now is the time to, to really set up a good, solid uh, coastal stewardship program for Audubon. Are there any more questions for David? I don't see anything else in the chat Just currently. One, one question, are you hoping to get the Migratory Bird Act fully reenacted? Oh, wow, yes, we are, we are. And now with the change of the administration, that will help. And um, we have, you know, National Audubon's policy team are working on that as a very high priority and they have done for the last three years, ever since it was first undermined by the Trump administration. I've assisted them a little bit in Maryland uh, on that over the last couple of years, but um, I, um, I'm, I'm gonna be focusing more on these conservation projects on the ground from now on. And I can't wait to get a policy staff person in place here who can really work on the MBTA and many other things in Maryland. But basically, Gwen, in answer to your question, the answer is yes, <laughs> we will. So um, David, can you tell us a little bit about this consolidation to the regional office? Will, yeah. you, will you be physically moving or uh, will you still stay in your current office? You know, this, this location makes best sense for me. And um, so we'll be maintaining um, our current uh, array of offices. And the new executive director, I'm not sure who it is yet. I did meet the candidates. And so I have, you know, I, I know which one it will be out of, I know out of three people it will, who it will be, but not the individual. And so where they ultimately settle in an office will depend on where they're based. And it could be that they're based up in Pennsylvania could be that they're based down here in Maryland. Um, we see no reason to kind of uproot people. You know, people are currently located where it makes most sense. And of course, now that we've uh, mastered this uh, Zoom technology, 
you know, we can kind of, it's actually really good for a large office to, to have that so that we can have staff meetings wherever we are. And um, we're going to be making use of the Zoom format from now on. It's, uh, it really is uh, very useful. We really love it, um, partly because it enables folks who can't always drive at night to attend. Mm -hmm. And it also enables us to record and keep things for posterity for folks yeah. to see asynchronously online. And um, I expect even when we do get back together that we'll also be doing recordings of the session and posting them. It, it just makes sense. It does, especially for these presentations. Uh, so you can't replace like getting together in person like for, for kind of planning and, and kind of like brainstorming for actions and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's a really important point to make, you know, make these meetings and uh, presentations accessible to everyone. And, and the Zoom platform really does that nicely. Well, I don't see any other questions. If no one else has any, um, I would just love to thank you for presenting tonight and um, sharing with us all your magnificent research. We've, I've learned so much and I'm even more desperate than I was before now to get a black skimmer on my life list. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe uh, come over next summer and we'll show you one. Oh, that would be awesome. That would be really cool. So thank you so much, David, for speaking with us tonight. And um, yeah. Thank Ooh, you. We hope for it's some better pleasure. times, better times for all bird conservation soon. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, things can only improve, right? Especially right. Today. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. Wonderful. So, well, yeah. thank you again. It was really fascinating. Yeah, well, thanks, it. everyone. I, uh, I, I love Southern Maryland Audubon. It's a great chapter. So it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here for you. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everybody. I'm going to end. Good night. Bye. Thanks, David. Thanks.